Well, we serve a great God, don't we? And uh, it is great to be reminded of that. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, to Psalm chapter 23. Psalm 23. And uh, it is good to see you this morning. I anticipate uh, that we will uh, be shorter this morning than most uh, weeks as uh, I can't really breathe through my nose. And so it's either talking or breathing, and I like both. And uh, it is very difficult to do both at the moment. And so I have a feeling we're going to be here a little shorter than normal. Uh, But let's do this. Can we listen intentionally? And I'll do my best to speak intentionally. And uh, let's not waste the time that we have together here today. And it sure is good to see you. I'm thankful that you're here. We started last week this sermon series called Overloaded. And we said that one of the most common characteristics of our culture today is that everybody experiences overload. We have so much going on, we feel overloaded, overburdened, overwhelmed. I showed you the three pictures last week, and I see some people that weren't here last week, so I figured I'd show them again. Uh, we have this, uh, this vehicle right here uh, that is a bit overloaded. Matthew? Matthew's waiting for the picture to come up on the screen, but he's the one that has to press the button. So look at that guy right there. That is, uh, that is how you move right there. One trip, just get it done. And uh, next picture there, Matthew? That, uh, that axle had better days. We don't know what's in those packages, uh, but that axle doesn't care, does it? Next picture right here is my favorite, the donkey. He is singing right there. You can't tell, but he's saying, I believe I can fly. Yeah. You see what I did there? Psalm 23 this morning. Uh, some of you that didn't smile earlier, I knew you had it in you, and I'm very proud of you that you just let, let it go right there, which brings up another song to my mind. I'm kidding. I'm going to stop singing right here. <clears throat> let's stand together if we could, and uh, let's read the psalm together. We did this last week. Yeah, I'd like to do it again today. I'd encourage you, this is not a large psalm, it's six verses. I'd encourage you to possibly each day, as, uh, before you start your day, maybe you're on your way to work, maybe you're first getting there, uh, read through this passage as you're going home, before you go to bed, uh, read through this passage, uh, take the week and just absorb it, and uh, you'll find that you can memorize it much quicker uh, than you think you can, and uh, that'll be a great blessing to you. Uh, I'm going to actually let you guys read this uh, this morning, beginning in verse 1, reading down to verse number 6. I'll start you out, and you just finish for me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for the day that we have to come and to worship you. And I pray it be a profitable day. We thank you for the chance to fellowship together. Father, I pray that you be with my voice. I pray that you give me exactly uh, what you'd have me uh, say today. I pray that I would be uh, faithful uh, to declaring your word. Father, I pray that you would allow me to uh, just have some endurance here in my voice and uh, just be able to uh, get through our, our message this morning. Thank you for the truths that we'll learn this morning, for the way that they can change our lives. And Father, we know that your word will not return void, and so now we ask that it would accomplish everything you set it out to do. May your spirit move in our midst, and we uh, will thank you, we'll praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, Last week we studied the first three verses of this passage. We discovered that we can experience renewal and rest in this incredibly fast-paced and overstressed uh, society, when we focus on our relationship with Christ, we rest in His uh, provision. Life gets exponentially uh, more complicated. We get overloaded uh, when we take our eyes off of Him, and when we focus on the problems rather than the solution, uh, when we allow ourselves to get discontent with His uh, provision. If we can't be content with what the Lord has provided for us, then fear and anxiety and stress uh, will follow us uh, all the days of our life. 
So this morning, we're going to turn our attention to the next verse, verse number 4 there. The Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We understand that we're talking in verse number 1 as a context to this passage about the Lord. Excuse me. <coughs> Just mute me if you see me about to cough, Carl. That means you have to stay awake this morning, and uh, that would be a blessing. Um uh, so we understand we're in the context of uh, the Lord being our shepherd. And so we're talking about uh, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We're talking about uh, God, the shepherd, that great shepherd is with us and his rod and staff. Uh, they comfort us. There's so much in this verse and I, I'd love to uh, take several weeks even on it. Uh, but here's the main point that I want you to get uh, from this passage. And uh, here's the takeaway I want you to take away today. And that's this. When you're at your darkest... A moment when you're struggling the most, remember this the shepherd is always present, and the shepherd is very uh, powerful. The shepherd is very present, and the shepherd is powerful. As we begin this sermon, let's take a look at the scenario that the psalmist is laying before us here. Uh, verse number four Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you could say, When I'm walking through the deepest, darkest moment of my life. Oftentimes, God allows us to go through difficult moments, dark places. But He often leads us into deep and dark places. The scenario here that's laid before us, the shepherd is actually uh, leading them uh, through this shadow. In the case of the sheep and the shepherd, most of the uh, efficient shepherds would endeavor uh, to take their flocks uh, to uh, distant ranges uh, so that they could feed and graze and, and have plenty. Uh, but these uh, ranges were up in the mountains, and so during the summer months, uh, they would uh, go up to these ranges. And, and during these times, the sheep would be uh, totally alone with their shepherd, and they would take steep, uh, rough, dark trails uh, through the mountains and through the valleys. And uh, the shepherd would take the sheep up through those moments. Excuse me, up through. Guys, I don't have a whole lot here in my voice, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to move pretty quickly, and so move with me if you can. He'll take these sheep through uh, these passages, these dark valleys, and they would find uh, waters in the valleys. They would find uh, forage there, uh, but often through these valleys, they would experience uh, a much more predators than, than they would throughout uh, their normal grazing patterns and periods, right? So as they're walking through the valleys, uh, these, uh, these predators would come. And so as he says here, Yea, though I walk uh, through the valley of shadow of death, uh, we understand that David has experienced being a shepherd and experienced having sheep. And so he's experienced leading sheep uh, in similar patterns. And he, he knows what it is to be that shepherd that protects his sheep through uh, those valleys. And, and notice the way he explains this passage. He says, yes, uh, Yea, though I walk through the what, valley of the shadow of death. And I want you to understand the wording there because it's extremely important uh, that we understand what's going on here uh, because it lays the foundation of everything else that will take place. Uh, the valley of the shadow of death. Notice he says uh, the shadow of death. He doesn't say the valley of death. He says the valley of shadow of death. Now what is a shadow? What is a shadow? If I'm standing and there's light behind me, it'll cast a what? A shadow. How many of you have ever been attacked by a shadow? All right, some of you raised your hands. I don't know what to think about that. I think maybe you were asleep. Uh, it's not Peter Pan. This isn't, these aren't real. Uh, but I've never been attacked by a shadow. Uh, shadows are simply uh, illusions. They are mirages, if you will. There may be something somewhere else, but a shadow can't do anything to hurt you. You say, well, what about a shadow holding a knife? Uh, well, thankfully, a shadow uh, holding a knife cannot stab you. But if there is a shadow holding a knife, you probably ought to run because they're somewhere around you, right? Shadow can't hurt you. That was funny and nobody laughed at that one either. <clears throat> Shadows cannot hurt you in this scenario. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, oftentimes life can seem like it's going to wipe you out, right? can seem like it's going to destroy you. The, the difficulty you're facing, the darkness that you see, it seems like it's just going to take you out. 
But here David says, as the shepherd, you're leading me through a valley. And although it may appear to be uh, uh, like the shadow of death, it is but that simply a shadow. He goes on to say, uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why is it that David can say he as a sheep and God is his shepherd he can go through life and not fear evil. Why, why is it that he can say the sheep uh, can be uh, uh, able to function and not, uh, not fear? We see in this passage two claims that I believe it would be extremely helpful for us to remember when we are in the deepest, darkest moments of our life. And so there's two points this morning. It's very simple, very, very plain, very, uh, very uh, just really uh, foundational and here are the, the two claims that I would give you this morning. First of all, what we're to remember, when, the dark, when, when in the dark moments of our life, number one, remember that the shepherd's presence is enough. If you write anything down, write that down. I want you to go back to that. Think about that later. Remember that the shepherd's presence is enough. In the deepest anguish and struggle in our lives, when we, feel, when we feel we're in the deepest darkness. We've got to acknowledge this. God loves us and He is present with us. It's not, it's not that we don't need encouragement or that we don't need a prayer, but in the end, here's what we've got to come back to. We've got to, we've got to remember, we've got to know Jesus is enough. A perfect last song to be sung right there. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Charles Weigel was the man who wrote that song. He was a, a tenor evangelist. He was a songwriter. And uh, he had been married for some amount of time. He would travel the country and he would uh, sing. He would preach, things like that. Came back from a meeting. His wife wasn't able to go with him. He found a note on the counter that said, Charles, I cannot do this any longer. I can no longer be your wife. We can no longer continue this relationship I've decided to leave you. And so for some amount of literally years, Charles Weigel suffered with depression and uh, suicidal thoughts. I mean, his, his life as he knew it uh, had fallen apart. And Charles Weigel took several years, but he eventually began to come out of that. And he sat down and he penned the words to that song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. And if you read it and think about it, you'll understand the, the premise, the foundation uh, of his thought there. Is not, it's not a dig at his ex-wife or the woman who had left him. The, the, the foundation of that thought is this, uh, people will fail us, but Christ doesn't fail. Right. People let us down. People can hurt us. Even people with greatest intentions can, can disappoint us. But Christ never uh, fails. So in the difficult moments of your life, remember this. Remember the shepherd's presence is enough. In Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6, we're reminded of a truth that uh, encourages me when I get uh, discouraged. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. God's given us a promise, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Hey, uh, His becoming our father, our becoming His child, that is, a, that is a lifelong relationship. That is an irrevocable promise that He has given to us. Hey, listen, you'll be my children, I'll be uh, your father. He told the children of Israel in Isaiah 43, and I, I'll not take this out of context to apply it uh, specifically to us. He is speaking to the children of Israel, but understand the same God that promised this to Israel is the same God we serve today, the same God who we call our Father. Isaiah 43 said, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. What are those verses saying? Both the passage in Hebrew, uh, the passage in Isaiah. Here it is. The character of God is as such. When he adopts you into his family, when you become his child, you are his child. Well, Jonathan, I, that makes sense. I mean, that, yeah, yeah, but when's the last time that we remembered that in those dark moments? 
Because the truth is when the darkness closes around us, when that fear and anxiety and depression and discouragement builds up, when we feel like uh, the pressures of the world are pushing on us and we feel ourselves begin to crumble, oftentimes we think about our circumstance, we think about the vice grip of life, but we forget that truth, and that truth is this, that His presence is enough. What are you saying, Jonathan? What, what do you mean? Here's what I'm saying. When you're struggling, know that He's still there. When you're hurting, know that He's still there. When you feel like the wolf's about to come take you out, when you get stuck in the brambles of life, when the rest of the herd moves on and you're stuck, remember, He's still there. Believers are never in situations that God is not aware of. He never leaves. He never forsakes His children. All right, here's the second thought. I told you we were going to move quickly. We've made point one. Here's point two. We're going to make point two, and we're going to go to lunch early. How's that sound? Sound good? All right, here's two. Now, we have a quiz, by the way, at the end of the service. I'm going to ask you what points one and two are, and if 90% of you don't get it, we re-preach the whole thing again. All right, Beth Ann's going to come and preach round two because my voice hurts, but she's, she's got plenty of voice in there, and she'll give you round two. All right, here's the second thought. So remember the shepherd's presence is enough. Secondly, remember the shepherd's power is enough. Notice what it says at the end of verse number four. It says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I want to show you a picture here. I was doing some research on this because I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, preach on this and, and be ill-equipped. I, I'll be very honest with you. I had always kind of thought that when the Bible's talking about the rod and the staff, I'm kind of thinking they're the same thing. You got the rod, the stick part, and then the, the rest of it is the staff. And I, I kind of just thought of it as the same way. But shepherds would literally have almost, it's almost like a bully club kind of thing uh, that they would, co- that they would uh, carry around called the rod. And it would, it would, be, a, it would be a sapling that they had uh, pulled out of the ground. And they would uh, carve it and whittle it down with great care and patience. And the, the enlarged base of it where, where the trunk joins the roots uh, that would be uh, shaped in kind of a, a smooth, kind of a rounded head uh, kind of thing. And, and, and the sapling itself would be uh, carved in such a way it would be shaped uh, to exactly fit whoever the owner of that rod's hand was. And so the shepherd would be well acquainted with his rod. They would throw it. Uh, they would uh, learn to use it with uh, amazing accuracy. The rod became a, a main weapon of defense for the shepherd uh, and his sheep. And if you would look at a shepherd using his rod, you would be uh, amazed by how skilled they were in using, uh, using this rod. It was almost as if it were an extension of his arm. It was, it was a sign of his strength and his, his power, his, his authority over anything that would try to harm the sheep. It was through uh, a rod that Moses uh, uh, used that miracles were made manifest, not, not only to convince uh, Pharaoh of Moses' commitment and, and, and his place there to accomplish what God had called him to do, but also God used the rod to reassure uh, the children of Israel. And as I was thinking about the, wor- the rod and the staff and the, the, the two uh, different designs and the two different roles, and we'll get to the staff in a moment here, I was thinking about what those things are like in our lives. And we could say that the rod for the Christian is, is likened to the Word of God. The Bible would be like the, wor- the rod for us this morning. The Word of God uh, would be like the rod. Uh, the rod would be used in uh, examining and, and counting the sheep. Ezekiel chapter number 20, uh, verse 37 says, I'll cause you to pass under the rod, and I'll bring you under the bond, into the bond of the covenant. And so uh, they would literally bring their sheep, and as they were bringing them into wherever they were going to pasture them, they'd bring them in, and they'd use that rod. And the sheep would literally pass under there. They would, they would count. They would also use that rod uh, to push back the wool. Because of the, the wool being so long, it was hard to detect uh, disease and wounds and uh, defects in the sheep. And so the sheep would pass through it. They'd take that rod and they would part that sheep's wool uh, to determine the condition of the, of the sheep. And if you notice, uh, well, yeah, I say if you notice, probably none of us are ever going to see this in person but if you ever see anybody selling sheep, 
you can, uh, and, and this is not because I'm uh, very knowledgeable about sheep. I did a lot of studying uh, about sheep because I knew nothing uh, about sheep. But you can shear a sheep in such a way that it looks like the sheep is in perfect condition. So if you ever see anybody that knows anything about sheep, they'll go up to a sheep that looks like his wool is in perfect shape, looks like a, a beautiful uh, specimen of sheep, and they'll part the wool because they want to get down and see what it is, uh, what condition that sheep is actually uh, in. And you think about God and how He examines our life. The Bible says in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way uh, everlasting. God's Word, one of the things that it accomplishes, is it searches us. Searches us. God's Word has the ability that as we uh, take it in, it has the way to uh, uh, peel back layers of our heart. It, it has the ability to kind of get inside of us and do surgery, right? Doesn't it? How many times have we sat under the Word of God and we've heard the Word of God spoken and we've said, Oh man, my life doesn't match up right there. Uh, there's some work to be done right there. Oh, that's God's intention. Uh, that's God's expectation. Uh, but I'm not meeting God's expectation there. Uh, the word of God, uh, that rod there, it, it's used to, to inspect. <clears throat> Bible says, <clears throat> the Bible says, uh, speaking of God being our power, our strength, our, uh, our help there, and talking about his rod, that uh, picture of the shepherd's uh, power, the Bible says in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength. He's a very uh, present help in time of trouble. Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High is shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I'll save the Lord. He's my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. I love that picture there of the, the rod. I love the picture of God's power. I love the correlation in this story talking about how we'll stand in the shadow of the Almighty. I want to paint a picture for you here. <clears throat> I know this is going to be really hard for you to believe, but I used to be a really annoying kid. I know seeing me today, thinking about that, it's hard to make that correlation. <laughs> But I used to be really annoyed. I was uh, I was really small, and all the all the kids my age were a lot bigger than me. And so I decided that the only way I could uh, keep up with them is if I made fun of them and brought them down, like put them in their place. And so I I had the quickest mouth. I just I just say dumb stuff. And so after church, I, I went to a church and. Uh, uh, Wednesday nights, we'd have a kids program. After a kids program let out, we'd all run outside. We all literally run around and play. Uh, we lived in Kentucky, nice weather most of the time, and we just run outside. We play, and it was it was a given that I was going to go to these two three kids my age, and I was going to say something dumb, and they were going to chase me. It was just it was a given. That's what we do, and we chase each other all around all around the property. And uh, so here I come, and they're expecting it. And I mean, we'd all wear tennis shoes and stuff like that just because we were going to do this. I mean, it was just what we did. Uh, I got beat up, and they chased me. It was great. <laughs> well, what I realized was I had this, uh, this guy. I've told you all stories about him before. His name's Daniel. He was my pastor's son. Uh, really loved me, invested in me. Good, just good, solid teenage guy. And uh, I'm, I'm like eight years old. And uh, I found that if I would run to him, they wouldn't mess with me. So I could say whatever I wanted, and I could just run, and as long as I got to him first, they, they wouldn't beat me up. It, it was because I'd run to him, and he was a whole lot bigger than everybody else, right? It was, I'd just get into his shadow. You listening? And as soon as I got there, I was safe because they weren't going to mess with me because they were scared of him. And that's what that idea there in Psalm excuse me, Psalm chapter 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Here's the thought. Nothing can mess with you when you're in the shadow of God. Hey, listen. Your God is not just present. He is powerful. So we looked at the rod there and looked at the picture there, that club, that power, the staff. Let's look at the staff this morning. Staff was an instrument that was, and by the way, 
uh, it would not have been as closed on the end there. You're wondering how in the world does he get that around the neck of a sheep? It would have been a little more open there. Uh, but that was the closest picture to accuracy that I could find. And so it would have been a little bit more uh, like a candy cane. All right. Uh, that staff would have. The staff would have been used uniquely as an instrument for the care, the management there of the sheep. <clears throat> it, uh, it signified the concern and the compassion that the shepherd would have for the sheep. It gives the sheep comfort, that, the staff long, slender, that hook on the end. It would be selected by the shepherd to be used, and that, uh, that staff would have been something that would have been a, a comfort to the shepherd. The shepherd would have uh, leaned on it for support, but it, it would have also been something that he would use for, for correction. Thinking about the rod, the rod we could liken to the Word of God, the, the staff we could liken to the Spirit, the Spirit of God. We could see the, the action in our lives of the Spirit of God. The staff, uh, three, different, uh, three different uses for uh, the staff and sheep. Number one, uh, drawing the sheep together. He, he'd use that uh, staff. It's actually really interesting. When a, when a sheep would give birth, he would use that staff uh, to gently lift a newborn lamb and, and place it with its mother if it were to get separated. And he'd use that staff so that way his, his scent wouldn't be on that lamp. And so he'd use the staff to pick up that, that lamb and take it gently over to his mother there. So that, that, that picture there of, of using the staff, the comfort there, it's that idea of, of drawing the sheep uh, together in an in a intimate relationship. Staff would also be something that he'd use to guide the sheep. He wouldn't take that rod and throw it at a sheep. He'd, he'd use that staff and he'd, he'd guide it. He'd, he'd use... He'd use that staff by gently touching the, the sheep's side and just applying some pressure there so it would, it would turn. So that, that, that staff was used as a communication between the shepherd and, and the sheep. The third use was to dangle sheep from brush. He'd use that staff and he'd push back brambles that had attached themselves to the, to the sheep and he'd free the sheep from the hold that would be uh, had on them and, as we think about that, we think about the work of the Spirit of God. Isn't it that like the Spirit of God? The Spirit draws us into Himself. The Spirit is that, that one that communicates with us God's work in our lives. That Spirit is the one who, who nudges us and, and, and moves us and, and steers us when we're prone to wonder, isn't it? You're looking at me like you're not prone to wonder. <clears throat> I know my voice is wonky, but stay with me for a minute. Each and every one of us are prone to wander. Each and every one of us are prone to kind of do our thing. That's why God deposited the Holy Spirit of Him, uh, the Holy Spirit into our lives. Is He wanted to steer us? He wanted to uh, guide us. He wanted to have that that intimate communion with us. And so, when you become a child of God, God deposits Himself, the Holy Spirit, into us. And so that Holy Spirit leads us and He guides us. And that, that is likened to that staff that's just, that's just steering there. Each and every one of us, if we're not careful, we can end up who knows where. Because oftentimes in my life, what I want and what God wants for me are not the same thing. Can I get a witness there? Oftentimes what I want and what God wants for me are not the same thing. The cultural say and, and my own selfishness will say and and all these other influences on my life will say, well, go this way, do this thing. This will make you happy. This will uh, give you contentment. And the Spirit of God says, hey, no, no, my child. No, no, my child. It's not what I've designed for you. It's not what I've built you for. That's not what I, I have planned for you. Uh, my child, that is not my will for you. Are you listening to me? If you're a child of God, you can relate to the Spirit of God working in your heart and saying, hey, no, that is not the way. That is not right. That is not that, that correction, that staff of correction. I don't know about you, I'm thankful for the power of God. I'm thankful for that rod that represents the shepherd's strength. I'm thankful that uh, he can pretty much uh, face anything. Uh, not pretty much face anything. He can face and dominate anything. I'm thankful that he is the greatest uh, victor that the world's ever known. He is the one who spoke the world into existence. Hey, listen, he is a powerful God. I'm thankful for that. But I'm thankful for his, his staff. I'm thankful for his spirit because it's his spirit that lives in me. It's his spirit that I can share life 
the with. What a tremendous thought that, that is. We love the idea of God protecting us from those situations that will hurt us. We love calling Him to fight off our enemies with His rod. I don't think we always appreciate the staff like we need to. I don't think we always appreciate His Spirit like we should. If we're not careful, we'll miss this point that oftentimes He has protected us not from the wolves or the bears or the lions. He's protecting us from ourselves. As a loving father, he wants to correct us and discipline us, get us going on the right path again. That introduces us to this concept of brokenness. If you've been around this church for any amount of time, we talk about brokenness a lot. We're, we're broken people. You look at our website, our purpose statement, I think, is we're a bunch of broken people seeking to make much of Jesus. We're, we're, we accept around here that we are broken. None of us have it all uh, together. Sin has left us broken and, and dysfunctional. We cannot fix ourselves. But God's promise is that when life breaks us, that He'll be close to us. He can even heal us. The Bible says in Psalm 34, 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and He saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. It's interesting because David penned another well-known psalm, Psalm 51, and if you're... Familiar with your Bible, you understand David wrote it after Nathan confronted him with his, his fling with Bathsheba. He falls in lust with Bathsheba. He acts on it. He sleeps with another man's wife. He impregnates her. Ultimately, he has that man, Uriah, murdered to cover up his sin. But God knows and he sees it all. So he sent Nathan to confront him. He, he sent Nathan to tell David, hey, listen, David, you ready? You're broken. So Psalm 51 came from a heart of brokenness. And at that time, that, that brokenness wasn't from a, a hurtful circumstance. It wasn't from an injury inflicted on him by an enemy. The one doing the breaking was none other than God himself. Psalm 51.8 says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear me because this will... This will help you. It helps me. That's gross, isn't it? I'm sorry, but if it didn't happen, we were going to be struggling here. So, David understands that a shepherd sometimes has to discipline, correct a wayward sheep. So what shepherds would do if there was a sheep that would refuse to stick with the flock or follow the commands of the shepherd... The shepherd would literally break one of his legs. Well, that sounds painful. That sounds cruel. Pete would have a fit, wouldn't they? I thought that was funny, too. Because that lamb couldn't walk, the shepherd would literally carry that lamb on his shoulder. Sometimes it would take weeks for that leg to heal. But here was the result. That lamb would be so drawn to the shepherd after being carried on his shoulders, that when his leg healed again, the sheep wouldn't stray. So Psalm 51, David says, the bones that are broken in my body, the bones of my soul that are broken, you've broken them. Because I wandered, and you chastened me. Psalm 51, verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, will thou not despise. That rod, it offers protection from the attacker. That staff offers guidance. But listen, sometimes, sometimes it brings pain. But what the psalmist, what David says here, is that because of the love in that brokenness, the pain in that brokenness is minimalized, and he can say, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I want to give you this thought here as we close, and I want you to really think about this. <clears throat> there are times in our life where we deal with tremendous adversity, 
And it's because our shepherd is leading us through it. And he allows us sometimes to go through trials. But there are also times in our life where we deal with adversity and we deal with tremendous pain. And that is the shepherd chastening us because he loves us. Now, this is the part of the message that a lot of preachers would like to preach. And it's not a popular thing because it's, it's you ready, it's painful. And popular and painful are not synonymous, are they? But the truth is, because God loves you, God will chasten you. And David, the psalmist who experienced the chastening hand of God. Now, let me remind you, how was David chastened? Well, Nathan confronted him. That had to have hurt his ego, wouldn't it have? Yeah. But ego was nothing compared to the death of that child. You listening to me? David's inability to build the temple because of the blood on his hands. Amnon, Tamar, Absalom, remember the brokenness of his family? Are you listening to me? Why did God break David? You ready? Because God loved David. There's some of us that we go through life and we think if God really loves us, he's just going to feed us treats all the time. But God's a good God. Sometimes he spanks us. And we would do well when we're getting spanked to not say, oh, the devil's spanking me. Because the devil hates me. All circumstances of life are catching up with me. Life's so hard. No, no, no. We've wandered. And because we've wandered and God loves us, chastens us. Chastening's not fun, is it? If you've ever been spanked by God, it's not fun. But it is necessary. And at the end of verse number four, bring up verse number four there, Matthew. We'll close here. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. His presence, right? Thy rod and thy staff. What does it say there? Those three words. They comfort me. But pain is not comfortable. So how can he say that? Here's the comfort in it. You ready? He recognized the discipline of God as God's presence and power in his life. He recognized the chastening of God as God loving him. These guys, these football guys here, I love them. I love watching them play. I love watching them practice. I love, I get to hang out on the sidelines during the games. Man, sometimes Coach Pascal will get at you, won't he? Man, he'll tear you up, won't he? Let me you say amen right there. Oh, yeah. Lemetrius get a holding penalty. He'll be running in practice on Monday, won't he? Yeah. Is it because coach hates him? No. It's because he wants him to learn. He wants him to get better. Yeah. If you're a parent worth your salt, you got to say no sometimes. If you're a parent worth your salt, you got to discipline sometimes. Yeah. Why? Because you hate your child? Oh, no. Have y'all seen Sadie? You can't hate that child. Listen, three in the morning, she's screaming, she got a fever. You still can't hate her. She's precious. And the way that I look at that girl pales in comparison to the way God looks at me. You bow your heads and close your eyes today. <clears throat> man, I still managed to go for 35 minutes. <clears throat> Remember the presence of God is enough. Remember the power of God is enough. I don't know how the Lord spoke to your heart this morning. I am not and will never claim to be the Spirit of God. But I know this, God's good about talking to us when we need talking to. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what difficulty. I don't know what shadow you're facing. But I know this, I know if you're a child of God, He's with you. And I know He's powerful. If you're here and you're not a child of God, can I encourage you? Can I encourage you that He wants you to be? You're walking through this life, you're still going through valleys, aren't you? You're still facing darkness. 
You're still dealing with difficulty, aren't you? But the difference between you and me is not that I'm good, you're bad. The difference is I realized I was a best and I asked God to be my father and he is. The difference in me and you is just that I've accepted his grace and his mercy and you haven't yet. But today, today you can. So I'd ask you if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your savior. Can I ask you that you give special thought to that? Here's what I'd like for you to do. I'm not embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'd love to pray for you. If you say, Jonathan, if I were to die today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. That concerns me. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you slip your hand up there where you are? I'll not call you out. I'll not embarrass you. But if you say, Jonathan, if I die today, I don't know that heaven would be my home. I don't know that God is my father. Would you slip your hand up there where you are? All around the room. I see that hand. Thank you, young man. Anyone else? Anyone else? Listen, in a few moments, we're going to have a time where we spend some time praying to the Lord. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'd encourage you. We're going to stand to our feet. Some people are going to come and they'll pray here. I'd encourage you to step out from where you are, come to the front. Let me introduce you to somebody who can take the Bible and show you how you can be saved. Show you how you can have a relationship with the Father. That's the greatest decision you'll ever make. Everybody in this room will be happy for you. If you're here and you're a child of God, would you slip your hand up? You say, I am a child of God. I've placed my faith in Christ all around the room. Hey, Jonathan, sometimes I just need reminded of the presence and the power of my God. God's done something in my heart today. Might be on what I preached, might have nothing to do with that. That's the power of the Spirit, amen. If you say, Jonathan, the Lord spoke to my heart today, and do business with him, would you slip your hand up all across the room? See those hands? You put your hands down. Here's why I'd encourage you. Join us, go play. Stephen's gonna sing. We're gonna take a few moments here, and this this time is simply for you to respond to the Lord. If you'd like to come and pray here at the front, you can do that. If you'd like to pray in your seat, you can do that. If you'd like to come up here and have somebody pray with you, we'd love to do that as well. If you're here today, you don't know Christ as your Savior. Can I encourage you to step out from where you are? You may have friends on either side of you. They'll let you out. They'll be excited for you. They might even come with you. If you say, I'd like to talk to somebody about my salvation, would you step out from where you are? Stand to your feet, everyone. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. However, the Lord's spoken in your heart. Would you respond to him? We'll take a few minutes here and let it let you do business with the Lord. <clears throat>